limbo. According to Cambridge's dictionary, limbo means, quote, an uncertain situation that you cannot control and in which there is no progress or improvement. In football, Newcastle fans have been stuck in their own version of limbo for the last four months. For the majority of those fans, they were hoping, praying even, their new owners would be Amanda Staveley, the Rubin Brothers, and the Saudi Public Investment Fund. Huge breaking news this afternoon and a Sky Sports News exclusive. The proposed takeover of Newcastle is off. The Saudi-led investment group and their partners have withdrawn their offer for the club. The funds say the decision has been taken due to the prolonged process combined with the global uncertainty around long-term investments. The decision leaves owner Mike Ashley wanting to sell, but with potentially no buyers. With the season only five weeks away, we ask, what's next for Newcastle United and their fans? It's been an emotionally draining process. It has been a real challenge to cover. Um, and it's been even more challenging in the sense of dealing with fans because this is really jarred with, with the fundamentals of football. Liam Kennedy is a Newcastle United writer for JPI Media, and he is a co-host of the Mouth of the Time podcast. It's gone through geopolitics, it's gone through religion, it's gone through international relations, governmental relations, and it's gone back down to the very basics as well of, of fans effectively wanting the best for, for the club that means the world to them. So it's been a real emotional roller coaster from start to finish. Right now, as I'm talking to you, it is Tuesday morning. Uh, can you give a brief recap of the last week or so? What has happened since last Thursday when the Saudi Public Investment Fund withdrew their bid to buy Newcastle? Yeah, since last Thursday, we've seen the uh, joint statement, which was from the three buyers within the consortium. There's been a slight uh, retracing of the line since. We've seen the Rubin brothers, um, who are one part of that consortium, come out and say they were very disappointed and still fully supportive of the deal. We've also seen PCP Capital Partners, Amanda Stavely, she has also come out and said uh, things along the same lines. And then we've also seen Mike Ashley, um, who is the current owner of Newcastle United. Um, and he has also said he is 100% committed to this deal. Now, obviously, that could be taken in a, in a number of different ways, but I took it to mean he's committed to getting this Saudi Saudi finance deal done because Obviously, he wants rid of this football club, which he's held for 13 years, and he's got Will and Byers waiting at the table. But the one obstacle in between the, the two who both want this to be done, it has been the Premier League. And what have they said in response? The Premier League have kept their cards very close to their chest. They've been very guarded in that sense. But they have been leaking bits and bobs. And I think that's, that's the real issue for fans is that they, want, they don't want leaks. They want definitive statements from the governing body because there has been a, a distinct uh, loss of faith in the governing body. And um, I think we're starting to see a real ramping up of pressure now for the Premier League to make a call. Not only the buyers saying make a call, but also fans to, from fans, they, uh, they want the Premier League to answer questions with regards to this and just explain why they were unable after 16 and a half weeks to come to a decision, which we've heard from the buyers, they've said they answered every question possible with regards to this deal. And fans want to know why the Premier League could not make a call. You said that Ashley is still 100% committed to this deal. You know, what is the chance this deal is either rekindled or another investor comes in and buys the club? It's really difficult to say. If you ask me that now, I'm more minded to say that I feel the deal is a very, very difficult one to rekindle and get done. There is willingness on all uh, sides, but there were sort of issues with this deal, which we all know the, the background to it. The, the issues continued throughout this process and were never really resolved, basically regarding unpicking PIF, the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, effectively the Sovereign Wealth Fund, unpicking them from the actual Saudi state. MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is of course chairman of both, which kind of gets you to the point where you could see the Premier League found it 
relatively difficult to, to unpick the two. Well, let's kind of go back a little bit to four months ago, back in April, when there seemed to be optimism that this deal would go through. At that time, were you optimistic? Yes, there was a real wave of optimism. I would say it's probably been the coronavirus lockdown narrative across the footballing world. And there was a real positivity. There was a positivity. This wasn't just based on picking through the owners and directors test and seeing how all that works and the the regulations that need to be passed. A lot of fans have done that. There's been some great analysis out there by many people. And and everyone came to the agreement that it didn't look like the the buyers would fail this. So it was a common sense thing that people thought it would be okay. Everyone I've spoken to says that actually, in reality, it's going to be very, very unlikely that this deal won't pass. Premier League saying that the Saudis are not uh, proper owners of a football club is a diplomatic and political incident um, that I just can't see that being likely. And finally, But then there was also speaking to people in and around the deal who, who constantly felt like they were getting the right uh, noises from the Premier League in the early part of this process, that this would be passed. There's been some well-coined phrases around this, no red flags, green light, etc. But that was something that was that was put to me early on, that, that there hadn't been any red flags with regards to owners and directors tests. So that optimism came from a bit of common sense, but it also came from the word of the buyers. And, and I think that confidence almost faded by two weeks ago, that that confidence, as we can all tell now, was, was almost non-existent. So yes, there was optimism. And yes, it has been a body blow for everybody involved, not only Mike Ashley, not only Amanda Staveley, uh, the Rubin brothers, PIF, who've, who found this particularly jarring. They've been almost embarrassed by the whole thing um, had they because they had expected it would be it be waved through in less than four weeks but yeah it's been it's been difficult for the fans too I think everybody's felt this the reporters have covered on it also it's been an interesting experience to say the least what changed from everyone being so optimistic to this deal not going through really so there are a number of things so we had <clears throat> I've mentioned the the unpicking of PIF from the Saudi state. That was a later one. We've seen the piracy, which has been a constant throughout this. For anybody who doesn't know out there, obviously being sports, who are Qatar owned, own the MENA rights. Uh, So they own the rights to show the Premier League in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We've seen that piracy with regards to a box called Be Out Q. And we've also seen being blocked um, from showing anything, any kind of their TV. BN and Al Jazeera both blocked in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which has been a, a particular issue. There's been the WTO reports. There's also been, I'm, brushing, I'm, I'm not meaning to brush over this at all, but I don't believe it was a massive factor within this takeover analysis. But there has also been the human rights thing, Jamal Khashoggi. There's been so much, so much written, so much said about this. I genuinely am not 100% sure on this without being party to Richard Masters' conversations. but. I don't believe that the human rights, Amnesty International, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, even though they are massive, massive factors in in the grand scheme of things with regards to this topic, I don't believe they were massive. I think it's more to do with the the ongoing problems of piracy. There was a little problem with the WTO, which was never really resolved. Could have went one of two ways, probably in in hindsight went the wrong way. So there have been issues throughout this. And I think that's, that's why I stand here today and believe it'll be very, very difficult for this deal as it stands to pass any kind of owners and directors test when the Premier League took so long to get to the point they did. It's been described as the biggest and most outrageous piracy operation in history, which has been allowed to continue for the past three years. But that might all change now after the World Trade Organization, one of the most important international bodies of jurisdiction, issued its findings into the case of Saudi Arabia and the theft of TV broadcasting rights. You mentioned the WTO situation, and for me, that kind of seem like maybe the silent killer in this story or for this deal. You know, in June, the World Trade Organization ruled that representatives of the Saudi state had facilitated the breach of international piracy laws via the pirate TV network, Be Out Q, which you mentioned earlier. And Saudi Arabia kind of initially 
claimed that the World Trade Organization's ruling kind of vindicated its position. And then just last week, they formally appealed the decision. So w- what did you make of that incident? Because, in, you know, in my opinion, instead of kind of admitting guilt and, you know, apologizing, they kind of doubled down, which I can't imagine the Premier League was happy about. No, I don't know if the Premier League were happy or unhappy, but I think it's it doesn't take any expert analysis to think that it's quite easy to see the Saudis almost reacted the wrong way. They didn't doubling down was probably the exact opposite of what the Premier League wanted. The Premier League have been battling with this issue for three, four years now. They've been desperate to end piracy in the kingdom. Um, and this all stems back. This isn't something that's just cropped up with regards to football. This is about a whole lot more than football. This is a going back to a diplomatic crisis that dates back to 2017. In 2017, shortly after the kingdom and three of its allies imposed a land, air and sea blockade on Qatar, a new television network was unveiled named Be Out Q. The new channel was nothing more than a piracy operation that stole the signal and output from Be In Sports, the Qatari-owned subscription-based sports and entertainment network, and rebroadcast it around the world. There was basically a blockade put up against Qatar from a number of nations, Saudi Arabia being the key voice in that. And that's where this this BN issue comes from, the WTO. And I do, this is my opinion on this, but I do tend to think that there was actions taken by Saudi in 2017 and onwards um, without the mind that it would bite them in the backside almost three, four years down the line when they wanted to buy a Premier League football club. Um, We've seen the names BN, be out Q. I just think there was a level of arrogance there that, that they thought they could do what they wanted and unfortunately, it has proved problematic. You said the WTO being the, the silent killer, and, and I think I think that did carry weight. And the reaction of the Saudis was bizarre in many senses. I poured over the 125-word initial report and its findings, and, and I came out of that good few hours uh, with my head down with the idea that the Saudis, it was quite damning of the Saudis. It didn't connect the state to be out queue and the piracy, but it was very close to within the confines of, of yeah, the kingdom is what it stated within the report. So to see that the Saudis did then take a number of steps which were positive, and then all of a sudden we've seen probably about three weeks ago we've seen the idea that they fully blocked indefinitely. This was a forever block on BN being shown. Really, probably was not the answer the Premier League were looking for when when they've been keen to to sort of end piracy because this only would lead to increased piracy. You know, a lot of Newcastle fans are blaming the Premier League for this deal not going through. Is that fair or, you know, is there more to blame on someone else in this? I mean, it seems like, honestly, the Saudi bid was kind of more of the issue and not maybe the Premier League, but you're closer to this, obviously, than I am. No, I genuinely believe you're right in that assessment that that the problems of this takeover are not the Premier League's, but the process and the way it's been conducted, the lack of transparency is what's really angered Newcastle United supporters. Let's not, let's not hide from it here. They almost felt like a chance to dream again because we've had 13 years at, at this football club of pain. Of, of a, It's been a hope vacuum is how I would describe it. And I think people just, that door was opened again for some people. And I think that's where that anger comes from. And, and, and they're probably not going to take it out on the people that they want to still buy their football club. I think a lot of that anger comes uh, from the Premier League in that sense. But one thing that has to be addressed is this lack of transparency. There are no organisations, to my knowledge, that have this absolute lack of transparency. I've asked simple questions of the Premier League, talking about the nuts and bolts of the owners and directors test, not details. I don't want details of, of uh, confidentiality, etc. But they, they can't even answer questions on how this was conducted, whether you could run two parallel tests, whether you couldn't. It's been really challenging getting any kind of word from them. And I think... I think that's reflected media with the the voice of the fans in a lot of ways to get the answers for the fans. And we haven't been able to provide that because the Premier League have have doubled down. They've doubled down on their uh, confidentiality. And I I genuinely believe, I've described it this in columns, it's almost like a confidentiality cloak. They're just hiding behind it. And I think there's been a real building up of pressure from fans because they want independent an independent review of the decision-making process. They want to know why... And the Premier League were unable to come to a, an agreement on this, whether it was yes or no. And, and I think they're I think they're owed that because this means a lot to a lot of people. So where does Newcastle go from here? Does Mike Ashley have any sort of contingency plan? 
No, I think you can tell by his statement uh, last week where he said, never say never, we are 100% committed to this deal, but we have to get on with planning for next season under Steve Bruce. I think you could tell by the, the tone, we've never ever heard anything like that from Mike Ashley. It was via his uh, managing director, Lee Charnley, but the club have stayed tight-lipped throughout this and, and everyone kind of expected them to do so. But I think that was... That was telling that Mike Ashley, he's been desperate to get rid of this football club. There was, There's obviously been 13 years of pain for a lot of fans. People might not quite agree with this, but he really has turned off emotionally. A lot of people won't think he was ever in this emotionally at all, but he's really switched off. He was telling people back in May that this wasn't his football club anymore. Um, and I think he was desperate, desperate to get rid of it. He wanted it gone by April. And I think that's the one thing that's really changed in this. Newcastle United fans have always wondered whether Mike actually really wanted to sell, but I think it's gone from being like a, an insignificance to him to being a real issue because his, his businesses, his baby, Fraser's uh, group, Sports Direct, they've been struggling financially. And I think he's wanted to, to channel the funds made from the sale of the football club into his other businesses, which made him the man that he is today. So does he have a contingency? There have been talk of other bids. Henry Morris from Clear TV, based in the US, very, very little um, can be found about him. I'm led to believe that that deal is a bit of a non-starter. There's also been talk of another American consortium. There's been talk of, we've seen uh, James Pallotta. We've seen we've seen uh, potential from the Far East. There's been a, a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. This was the deal that was almost done. Um, I've taken criticism before describing it as 99% done but it was and um, because we've now been to the point where Mike Ashley has agreed to sell the club he's agreed a deal and it's been taken to the Premier League and um, we'd have to go through that long laborious process again where there be um, a new bidder uh, or potentially even a restructuring and I think that's desperately something that Mike Ashley wants to avoid because he's had enough and I think as much as Newcastle fans can take positive from that now the positive is that he's still here and, and he probably will be for the short to medium term, should there not be any kind of concessions made by either Premier League or the buyers. Do you see this kind of hanging over the head of the club for you know the next couple months and into next season? I mean, could we see this affect how they play on the pitch? Yeah, I genuinely think it could. I think that's a very real prospect. There's no, no end in sight to this. There is an urgency about it, but the Premier League have shown absolutely no urgency. This This started out, Really, in January, it started out in May last year, of course, uh, initially, but it started out in January when, when things started to leak out with regards to this deal. By fair estimates, it went, all documents were presented on the Premier League's table on April the 9th. Now there's been a lot of talk with regards to Project Restart, um, with coronavirus causing logistical issues, but it's not something that's particularly de- delayed this deal. The deal itself has delayed this deal um, and the Premier League's inability to, to make a decision on it because it's been worked on throughout this process with regards um, that they've had separate legal teams working on it. It's been a question and answer sort of between the two sides of a constant nature throughout. I think it's going to be very difficult to, to resolve and unless Mike Ashley can pull a rabbit out of the hat, which... I don't think he's minded to do. I think he wants this deal done. Then, then I think it's probably going to linger on for a little while. But that doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit the buyers, the sellers, uh, only Cassie United. It only, or it's probably only going to um, benefit their rivals within the Premier League because I, I could see this club really struggling with this. It's, it's, it's going to be a hangover that is almost unshakable should it not get the green light. Are you a fan of football today? Then why not support the show and sign up to our new Patreon page? You'll get access to bonus episodes, full interviews, and extra content. Just go on Patreon and search Football Today. Now, back to the episode. But where does this leave Newcastle fans? And what has the takeover process been like for them? To find out, we spoke to the head of Newcastle United Supporters Trust, and the co-host of the True Faith podcast, Alex Hurst. I think this takeover attempt was the, the last great opportunity for the football club to be run as one of Europe's top, one attempt to run the club as one of Europe's top clubs. This was a, a long thought out strategy by the potential buyers. It's been in the pipeline for a long time. It's not the first time Amanda Stavely has tried to buy the club. And, and from everything that they have communicated, through various media and, and through you know after card conversations with them this was going to be big i mean this is going to try and make Newcastle united into the biggest club in europe 
And while some people might not think that's realistic, it's a hell of a lot better aim than trying to finish 17th every season, certainly as a supporter. You know, there was a lot of ambition then, there was a lot of talking up the football club, whereas the current people who own the club talk it down a lot and, and talk about limitations and and look at other clubs and you oh, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do that. These guys talked about what they did want to do and that was encouraging. So how would you describe maybe your emotional state now? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very tired because at the Supporters Trust, we know we've gained nearly, I don't want to give an exact figure, but I think nearly 2,000 members in the past 24 hours. You know, we're trying to give fans an outlet here, and we're going to try and get questions from the Premier League. It's a lot of work goes into that, particularly since it's uh, everyone who's on the board, it's an unpaid position. It's, you know, something we do alongside our day jobs, and it's just, after all that's been written, and, you know, we did media interviews around the world justifying human rights issues, justifying... You know, should a, a state like Saudi Arabia be involved in football? It, was, it just feels like a huge waste of energy and time. Like a huge waste of energy and time. And, and as supporters, we don't get anything out of it, really. It's, you know, speaking to the Independent or speaking to the Guardian. And I'm pleased that those guys wanted to accentuate fan voices like I am. But at the end of the day, they're the ones that get paid for this, not us. And I just feel like it's been... Like, I just wish, wish I'd never heard of it. <laughs> I, wish, I wish it would just cracked on as normal. I mean, it seems like it was universally accepted by Newcastle fans. I think I saw that almost 97% of your supporters group agreed with this takeover. Yeah, I, I know very, very few people who, who weren't. In fact, I know no one who was, against, who was against the takeover. There were some people who were uneasy about it. But the, the, the key thing about this takeover wasn't necessarily who was buying it to a lot of fans, even if there were doubts, just the fact to be rid of Mike Ashley someone who's as loathed as he is, was just a, a real unifying force. So everyone was on board, everyone. And you know, you'd you had people who had not engaged with the club in over a decade uh, when Ashley first did what he did to Kevin Keegan, who walked away, then members of my family, had got back into it for that, um, or, back, or, or certainly re-engaged with the football club and the fan base. Just a tremendous shame, really, and I think there's just a lot of desolation at, at something like this. You said that you had to defend, you know, the human rights abuses and some of the other parts of this takeover. You know, what was it like for you and, you know, other fans to kind of grapple with those issues? I, th I think that the, the, it wasn't so difficult for me. I understand some fans may find it more difficult. You know, if the Premier League had turned around, and, or, or, or turned around, I know they won't, but if they turned around and say, Allegations of human rights abuse in countries which have a large stake in Premier League football clubs. I think a lot of people would still be frustrated, but would respect that a little bit more. But that, but that isn't what's happened. So to be constantly asked something that the league don't care about, and that if it's not going to be Newcastle, will it be West Ham or Crystal Palace? Or and we can do this this never-ending circle of mor morality and what about me and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I had one journalist at The Guardian kind of say, if it was my club, you know, I definitely wouldn't do this. And that's all right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to try and convince anyone what they should or shouldn't do in terms of supporting their football club. But ultimately, if you, you know, that journalist at The Guardian, you know, he gets paid to, to read and write about a sport that welcomes these kind of people in. So, so why as a fan should I stop supporting my football club when the rest of the country and the rest of the sports industry, the rest of the world pretty much, doesn't care why 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 were a lot of people going to the bottom of the pile to try and get some answers from people who, who have no say in any of this. And I was told constantly, by the way, that we did have a say and we could stop this takeover. Well, that's bollocks, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy you brought it up. You know, what sort of contact have you had with either the Public Investment Fund or the Premier League? We've had no contact with the Premier League. That's what we really want. I haven't spoke to the Public Investment Fund. I spoke to Amanda Stavely over the weekend who who filled me in a little bit on what was going on and how fans could potentially help to try and get the Premier League back on board. And in this, We're going to try. The, the big annoyance from this is the, is the fact that it's, it's almost like this weird secretive process that has nothing to do with supporters. If there wasn't, if I wasn't here and other Newcastle supporters weren't here, if we weren't interested, there wouldn't be a takeover. There wouldn't even be a Premier League. We don't expect the Premier League to 
run everything by supporters. I, you know what? I, I would like that. I would like supporters to have a say who owns a football club, but I can accept that in the multi-billion pound industry that the Premier League is, that's unrealistic, sadly enough. But the Premier League have relentlessly leaked things to journalists and briefed journalists about this process. And as a fan, you've got to kind of engage with that. And I'm not talking about what people would a couple of years ago still do called clickbait or anything like that. I'm talking about Sean Engel of The Guardian, who's a respected sports writer, saying he has contacts at the Premier League, sources at the Premier League saying that this takeover is in doubt, that's not a, a reasonable or fair communication process. In the Premier League, now that this is, you know, PIF have withdrawn, their silence is deafening. Like even Lee Charnley at Newcastle United, you know, it was only about 50 words, the statement, but he spoke to Sky Sports. Like the fact that, it, you know, if you're being kind of out-communicated by the current people who are Newcastle United, something's seriously wrong with the communication strategy. No, no statement, nothing like that to say, why this has happened and let's be clear that the northeast here the northeast of england has missed out rightly or wrongly on, on 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 huge infrastructure and housing investment the rubin brothers who are part of the deal have said that publicly now we need answers and, and i'm not even saying the premier league have behaved badly or, or wrong i mean I, I, there are definitely accusations from newcastle fans that i was warm to about that stuff but if the premier league would be more transparent and say this is the reason it went so long. Premier League will have to protect Newcastle United and we'll have to do this, this and this and the buyers couldn't satisfy it. That would go a hell of a long way to, to people understanding because at the minute it just looks like a bit of corruption because you have BN Sports have briefed relentlessly, even to me, about this and Al Jazeera in Qatar. And it feels a bit surreal saying that about piracy and about TV rights and like I, I don't pretend that those things aren't important to the Premier League. Of course they are, but let's let's be clear here. Like there are two serious allegations here from the buyers: one that Qatar the state has influenced this process, and number two that Liverpool and Tottenham Hotspur have influenced this process against the takeover. They're serious allegations, and and I would like the Premier League to refute them. But then the longer they stay silent you know, the more you think, well, you can't refute the truth. So I guess what you're trying to say is that you would just like more transparency during the whole process. Yeah, definitely. And, and the Premier League hides a little bit behind non-disclosure agreements. And, you know, we, we wrote to Richard Masters, who supposedly, along with a guy called Bill Bush, have been the key movers behind this kind of almost rejection of the deal or the, the infinite delaying of, of, of any deal. And we got a response saying it's a, it's a confidential process. Well, now the buyers are talking about it, and now the sellers are talking about it. So why is it confident? Like, who's who's it confidential to? I kind of see that the problem with it, with them taking over this. Obviously, whatever's going on in that company is of huge issues, but it, that's not our issues. We're, we're regular football fans. Who, yeah, we come week in, week out, want to see how our club do well. That's that's another part of the world. I mean, if you look at every billionaire. Do you feel like? You know, Newcastle fans have kind of been just a pawn in like a geopolitical competition, you know, between. 